Hello, everybody. Welcome to this evening's event at 151. We're in a convened space, 151 West 42nd Street. My name is Helena Durst. I'm part of the Durst organization. We're happy to be able to sponsor tonight in coordination with NYRP. Um, this year's event falls on a very special anniversary year for NYRP, which is our 25th anniversary. And if you're new to NYRP and you didn't know, oh, we'll take the applause. Thank you. <laughs> Always love an applause. Um, we're fortunate enough to have our founder here tonight, Bet Midler, who, Bet and I actually, we have a shared passion, which is cleaning up garbage. We, we find peace in, in making things organized and beautiful. I want to take a quick poll tonight about NYRP. I'm the new co-chair with Darcy Stakem, who's over in the corner. We also have a few board members who I don't want to go on the lengthy naming who's here and who's not here. But as a new co-chair, I just wanted to do a lightning round of questions, if that's OK. Just a quick raise of, a raise of hands if you know these types of things. So how many people know that NYRP was part of the Million Tree Movement? Great. How many people know that NYRP has supported and, and owns more than 52 gardens across New York City in all five boroughs? Good. OK, this, is, this one's a tough one. How many people know that we also we teach environmental studies in public schools? Good, good. I'm, I'm happy to see this. And how many people know that we oversee over 80 acres in northern Manhattan in High Bridge and Sherman Creeks Park. Good. Actually, this is much better than I thought. This is a friendly crowd. This is great. We're getting our message out. I'd like for all the board members to see that we are getting the message out. We're doing a good job of that. And we'll continue on that. Um, so again, I want to thank all the elected officials from New York State and New York City that were also able to join us, as well as all of our community partners, because the community partners are what makes the organization happen and continue. I'm also proud to share that we have a brand new executive director, Lynn Kelly, who just started at NYRP this month, or last month. And Lynn joins, Lynn joins us from the New Yorkers for Parks, where she led as a spokesperson for the Play Fair campaign for parks. She helped secure a historic in investment of $44 million for the New York City Parks Department. We're very excited to have Lynn join us and continue leading us through the bureaucracy, the red tape, and continue driving us forward towards a cleaner, more organized, and beautif more beautiful New York City. Thank you, Lynn. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Gothamitis 2020. So first, Helena, I would like to thank you for hosting us tonight. And I also want to thank you that you didn't make the questions much harder, because I'm two weeks on the job, and I don't know if I would have gotten all the answers. So thank you for that. Uh, so as Helena mentioned, I am the new executive director of New York Restoration Project. I'm delighted. This is my first official public event with everyone here. And like many of you that are in the room, I care deeply about our open spaces and green spaces in New York. In fact, I've often said that I feel that parks and gardens are what give New York City its soul. It's what makes it authentic. It's what keeps it real. And I am uh, deeply um, involved in making sure that these spaces are equitably maintained throughout the city and that they're protected. And that's one of the reasons that I was so drawn to this organization. Um, it gives me great pleasure as well to be here with our fearless leader, uh, Bette Midler, whose vision and roll up your sleeves and get it done attitude uh, have, are still the basis of this organization 25 years later. Um, and it's great to be in such great company. I see a lot of former colleagues, new faces, community partners, uh, lots of folks in the, in the green and open space community, and more important, I've met some of the gardeners here tonight uh, doing the work day in and day out, and uh, I salute you because it's not easy work. Um, and of course, I'm delighted also to be here with the board, some of our supporters tonight, and the New Yorkers, uh, New York, what, did you hear that? New York Restoration Project team, uh, who's given me such a warm welcome in the last two weeks. Uh, 
We have a very special program, so I'm gonna set the table for you this evening. We could not be more honored um, to welcome landscape architect and MacArthur Genius Award winner, Walter Hood, who's going to be in conversation tonight with New York City's own WNYC, Arun Venegopal. And I encourage you to read more about them in the program that we gave out earlier. Oddly enough, uh, we learned in preparation for tonight that they actually share a Queens connection I think you'll hear a lot about Queens tonight. I am not a Queens girl, but all right, Queens in the house. We're happy about that. <laughs> uh, Arun is a proud resident of Jackson Heights, and as you will hear this evening, uh, Walter designed our Curtis 50 Cent Garden, Jackson Community Garden in Jamaica. Um, in fact, Walter's been a friend of NYRP for some time and transformed the Baisley Park Community Garden into the garden, which we now call 50 Cent. So in speaking and in preparation tonight with our speakers, with Walter and Arun, I was actually reminded of uh, what someone said to me when I went to a, a panel and I, then I further got to know a group that's actually represented here tonight. Uh, it's called Black Space. And at a Municipal Art Society panel, this group spoke about the importance that when you do community development and when you work in neighborhoods and it's a community-based planning process, you must move at the speed of trust. And that is something that has stuck with me for years. And I think you're gonna hear more about that tonight, and I think it's a really interesting topic that I hope we explore. With that said, I aim that tonight, and I hope our conversation is productive and provocative, and I hope it includes all of you. You'll see that on your seats, you have a little index card and a pencil. And so if in the course of the uh, evening, you hear something that resonates you or you'd like to uh, ask a question, please write it down and just pass it to the end of the aisle and my team will come around and collect it. And you can also engage with us on social media. That's another important conversation and the information is right here. So without further ado, please uh, join me with a warm welcome to Walter and Arun this evening. Thank you. So um, thanks everyone for being here. This is very exciting, and thank you, Walter, um, and thank you, NYRP, for hosting this. This is, um, uh, for me, this has got my brain really thinking in, um, in new ways. So uh, um, I'm also really thankful everybody turned out today during this, uh, what do you call it, got the Midas uh, pandemic edition, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it is a testament to the fortitude of New Yorkers. Um, please do not touch your face. <laughs> Silence your cell phones. Um, so it's funny just because like, with this latest crazy thing that's happening to us, I think I've had multiple conversations with people about like, oh my God, yet another thing to have to worry about. It's like we're just being like besieged by these crazy global, like world changing forces that are completely out of our control. Um, and I think that what's interesting about a forum like this is um, I don't think it's wrong to say that in the broader public, the imagination, that the idea about parks and gardens and public space in general um, is that there's a sort of benign apolitical quality to it. It's ornamentation. Um, it's just there, and it sort of exists outside of politics and all that messy stuff. And of course, that's not true. Um, but what I like about this opportunity is the chance to have a conversation about the extent to which um, you, know, you and your peers and your predecessors uh, approach public space, approach parks and gardens uh, with intentionality and what that means uh, in this era when there is so much change happening and the calls for social change are getting so intense, uh, how do we marry those calls and those conversations with what can easily be thought of as something that is separate from those conversations? Um, and so that's why I've been very grateful just to be kind of like in conversation with you already in the weeks prior to this. Um, and thankful to all of you for, for, for being here. Um, Walter, in order to have a meaningful conversation about uh, a project that you uh, completed some years ago, I feel like, um, and this is in Jamaica, Queens, uh, I need to begin with a quote from E! Online. This is the entertainment site, E! Online. <laughs> and this is from their Bizarre BFFs Roundup from several years ago. So I'm gonna read it in my best entertainment host voice. 
It's probably one of the most unlikely friendships ever created in show business. 50 Cent and Bette Midler. <laughs> and they rated a nine out of 10 on the weirdness scale. <laughs> and so I, for many reasons, I love the chance to talk about the 50 Cent Garden. But I guess before we get to anything else, um, did you meet 50 Cent? Um, no. You didn't? You didn't? Never met. Never met him. Never met him. So you have done this garden in his name, but you were not in conversation with him, but the community that surrounded this space. Yes. Um, we actually started working in the community prior to Mr. Jackson coming to the project. And this it was, is Curtis Jackson. I don't know if it was a myth in my brain, but I have the story. Um, that one day I came to the office and I was walking past Madison Square Garden and I go into the office and I see G unit on the ground floor. And I go upstairs and I go, who's that downstairs? And they go, gun it. I was like, no, it's G unit. <laughs> you know? And I think that's okay. when Barrett or someone else, they reached out and that's how it became part of the project. Really? It, because you happen Unless to... Unless that's my myth. I mean, it's 10 years ago. Um, but that's how... Even more. Isn't this more than 10 years? Is it 2007 or yeah. so? Yeah. 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 Okay, so basically, there's this patch of land, and maybe this is a good chance, a good moment, rather, to start the slideshow so you, you all can have a glimpse of this park that some of you have been to, but not all of you, uh, starting with the stone. Can we start that slideshow? Or I guess it's me right here. <laughs> Sorry. The power is mine. So um, here we have this, uh, just to give you a sense of the map, where we are, New York City map. We're in Jamaica, um, in Queens. And this is, this is what? This is not before it's completely done, is it, Walter? Yeah, this is uh, right before the grand opening. OK, so this is the complete, uh, completed project. Uh, do you want to describe any of the elements before we go further? Um, I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. They're parterres. Um, the garden is patterned after a French cooking garden, one in Sissinghurst, the Garden of Love. Uh, we made a lot of models that we showed the community, and they liked some specific ones. Um, there's um, a series of hedges, and the idea was to not only have it be a place of produce, but also a place of culture. Not only uh, a place of produce, but also a place of a culture. culture. So you're not just producing things, but I wanted to share with them the art of garden making. Huh. Right, and so by bringing you know these ideas that exist in garden history, right, to the site, for me this was almost the gift to a certain degree, right? That you know we let me back up. I was not a big fan of community gardens before this. Um, community gardens, I hated them, and um, because they were the go-to in neighborhoods that I lived in for all ills. Where'd you grow up? Um, well, it's a long story, from North Carolina through Philadelphia, New York, back to Philly, and now in Oakland, California. But what I'm getting at is the community garden had become a kind of trope where it's like, oh, um, there's high crime garden. Oh, there's no housing garden. And people were not looking at the larger kind of multidimensional issues that one has to tap to make neighborhoods, right? And so the garden is the easiest thing. And one of the things that Galen talks about, I'm glad you read the book, is by the time the open space movement came along in the 60s and 70s, the garden is the piece of park was the cheapest way for politicians to go into neighborhoods and say, we're doing something for you, right? Because you don't have to invest a lot. It's like a vacant lot. Oh, let's go build something. We're done. Everybody does their photo ops, and you go away. So these are people who are not, to use the phrase, moving at the speed of trust. Not at all. They're not developing, I mean, I, I don't want to like put words in your mouth. What is the process that I guess exemplifies that particular pace and that particular relationship that is, that, what does trust mean? I think the trust means this kind of intentionality that you talked about. One of our first projects in Oakland, California, it's called Cortland Creek Park. Uh, it's a three block, five block area along a sidewalk. And I went to a community meeting, and I did the typical kind of landscape architect architect thing. I put my drawings up, you know, and I expected people to be happy, right? And they looked at me and was like, what is that, right? And I went back to my studio, and I was like, what is wrong with this picture? 
And so literally I took the crayons out and I started doing these paintings. And I started collaging people's houses in the images, like their real houses. And I made a model. I did all of these things that I normally do for clients who are paying me a lot of money, right? And I went back to the next meeting and people were floored. They were like, wow, you took this time to think about us in this way. And it was the first time that someone had come in their neighborhood and done a presentation where it just felt like you cared, right? It felt like you had an artistic vision. And to this day, the city then said, Walter, we can't plant a monoculture down the street because I wanted them to be flowering trees, five blocks, 150 trees, right? And they said, we have to get the community to vote on it. And they said, and you can't come to the meeting. Wow. There's rules. Yeah. And I said, OK, fine. And I think I was in Europe. I went to Europe or something. And I got back. And one of the neighbors like, we voted 150 purple trees. <laughs> right? And if you go there in the spring for five blocks, blossom. And this is in a neighborhood where there's no investment. And over time, what happened was people, through those trees, start to see themselves differently. Hmm. And this is the power, I think, of, of landscape, of architecture, of urbanism, is that we, we can dream about these landscapes, right? You don't have to sort of think of, of them in paternalistic ways. Like, hmm, this community, they don't know where their food comes from. Um, we have to teach them how to do this. And Galen writes about this in from Reform Park on. But instead saying, look, I can imagine a different world for you, right? And when you can imagine a different world for people who don't look like you, it's pretty powerful, right? And this is the biggest thing that I think is the hurdle is for people who don't look like me to try to imagine a better world for me. Because I've been taught all my life to imagine a better world for people who don't look like me, right? That's what I'm taught most of the time. And those environments. So it's so easy to do something in Manhattan, right? You just drop some dust down and things happen, right? But you go out to Queens, you go out to these other places, and we need imagination. And this is one thing I've come to love about the New York Restoration Project is that when, I, when they asked me to do this, they had a vision of bringing designers like myself, Michael Van Valkenburg, others, into these places. And, and they didn't say, it has to be a place of production. Right? It didn't have to be a farm. Right? It could be whatever. And today we walked around, and we went to a few gardens. And it was nice to go into some gardens that some nice lawn chairs, a barbecue. Right? It was just nice. So someone had that vision. Like, it's not about people out here growing their food always. And so this imagination, I think, exists within this, um, this nonprofit. And I really love that they're open to those things. And then they care about them. Because I was like really kind of scared to go back to the garden today. Right? It's like landscapes you make where people don't take care of them, right? <laughs> Particularly in places like this. And it turned out that one of the original young men who started working on the project is still there. The project is beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I mean, because in the imagination, it, it somehow doesn't feel like someone just came in and dropped something in, right? It's had time to mature. You can kind of see things being replaced, right? I mean, that kind of renewal happening. And in a lot of our neighborhoods, you don't see that renewal. You do the projects, you walk away, and you just see decay, right? You just see decay. And then you can look back at those photos that people took. Hey, look at me, right? Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Let's, let's skim through a few of these other shots. Of, uh, some of these are construction. Some are the actual final product. But it's beautiful and very serene. Uh, people can kind of gather under shade if they want to. Uh, this is clearly when it was still being built. I was really struck by this. Um, this is, I guess, a trellis path yes. that lies on the outside I'm trying to think if you get a better angle on this. You can kind of see that's the current uh, existing thing. So those trees, uh, is the trellis path right, right behind? 
that sidewalk right on the back is essentially underneath the trellis, correct? Yes. Now, one thing that um, when we went out the other day that really struck me was that that is outside the garden and also outside the garden are those planters. Uh, and what's also striking is the fact that that is a very low fence. Mm -hmm. Now, all these elements kind of make me wonder, getting back to this word trust, when you have uh, planters that are outside uh, or other elements that are outside of the garden proper, when you have a low fence that people can scale easily, when you have other things like planters and other boxes that can be moved, taken by someone who feels like taking it, to what extent are you, is this a leap of, of trust? It's a leap of trust, yeah. I mean, but you have to have that. In design, you do that always. And again, when we talked about the boundary here, what I wanted to do was blur the boundary. And I wanted the public sidewalk to feel like it was part of the garden. And again, this notion of the boundary, right? The threshold, right? When you blur that threshold, then people don't feel like, wow, it's locked, I can't go in. They don't feel like, oh, that's not for me, right? If you sit on the outside, you feel like you're actually on the inside. And the other thing is the kind of the multiplicity of spaces, Like right? There's lots of different ways, right, spatially for people to sort of enjoy the garden. Hmm. And that's something that, you know, we do in a lot of the work in the studio is really try to, to break down, how can I say, those, those barriers, right, psychological barriers, right, and allow the garden, which the garden is this wonderful device. The garden has been probably around since we've been around, right? The gardens are, they exist in your imagination, so they can almost be anything to a certain degree, and so what we tried to do was make it, when you experienced it, feel like it was just a lot of things and there's just no boundary. And that corner, I wanted people to literally, if you're walking down the street, there's food growing. There's food growing there. Right? There's What's growing? growing? Do you know? Uh, right now, it's bare because it's winter. Mm -hmm. so. What grows otherwise? Anybody know? Fruit trees, they're every garden. That's right. There's, there's pits right now on the ground. What is that? Uh, is that peach. peach? There's peach pits right now yeah. everywhere. Yeah. They're just pits on the ground. <laughs> That's all worried. Um, so you've got all this, all this kind of growth happening, and you have people who come in and tend to it regularly. How do we create the system of that kind of like oversight? Is that on them? Yes, it's on the New York Restoration Project, and it's on the community. Mm -hmm. Again, it's this trust, um, this idea. Their big thing when we were working here, they were saying, you know, we have to... Every time we need water, we have to go across the street to get the hydrant, right? So that was like the beginning, and you don't show them here, but New York Times called them martini glasses, which I didn't like. Oh, um, but there are I these think, big blue. Yeah, I'll go back uh, to the initial funnels. shot. Of the, yeah, it's quite striking when you first see it. Yeah, those big go. blue funnels, and, and that catches the water, kind of and it goes into a cistern, and then you you can pump the water up. And it's a lot of water, right? Yeah. How and much was it? Tens of thousands of gallons. I mean, we worked with some guy, I think he was out of Jersey or someplace, uh, but it was awesome, the resources they brought of trying to figure this out, and now we're gonna put a solar pump in because the pump is really hard to get the water out. Uh, that will go on top of the blue. Um, yeah, there's a little hand pump, pump in the middle, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is, uh, what, 2007 or so? Yes, thank you. <laughs> because I suppose what, what strikes me is I only started noticing a few years after that, I think, 10, 12 years ago, um, what was very striking to me to be walking, say, through Union Square, um, and then eventually just around the corner here in Times Square to see loose furniture being laid out. And I remember thinking, like, wow, like, whose idea was that? It was exciting to me, but I also kind of wondered, like, how much theft is going to be required before they say, we're going to have to shut this down? never came to pass. Right. And now we can see it's been all these years and still there. But you were kind of doing this a few years before that. Was this sort of in the air of this aspect of it's a different city now? Because, I mean, 
for people who've been around long enough, they're thinking, oh, vandalism, graffiti, all the tagging of the 60s and 70s, um, very visible, something that affects all communities in some ways. Um, do you remember the conversation with people in the community when it came to these kinds of aspects? Um, I think people in the community, they, they really talked about they wanted picnic tables. I mean, the kinds of things that they talked about, they wanted a place to gather under the tree in the mm -hmm. shade. Mm -hmm. You can sort of see we have benches sort of sprinkled all through and, al and along the sidewalk. But going back to your note about, you know, the chairs, I just remember Laurie Olin, one of my mentors, you know, after he finished, um, what's the park in the library? Brian, Brian Park. <laughs> he gave this lecture on the, on the seats, on the, t on the chairs, yeah. moving in the lawn, and how over time they lost very few. Right? And a lot of people then begin to question a lot of these issues of permanent furniture. And I think the whole pop-up pop movement happened along with post-9-11 New York, where you had just these different ideas about how we could begin to use the public realm. Now, with that said, I wish, you know, um, I wish we can, again, try to imagine other ways other than now that these chairs are working, I find these chairs everywhere, right? To me, again, it, it's not about the imagination. You go to Boston, they got it, they got them in New Haven, they got them in Oakland, they got them in San Francisco. And these are all different places. And these are people living in different landscapes. And so again, for us, this notion of loose furniture, that's a, you know, that's a concept, but that's not really about place per se. And do you think that's more than just you as a creator who wants to do something that feels a creative, who wants to do something that's very thought through and unique? You think that it's also from the perspective of the end user who feels like this has kind of become generic? Yes. I do think, again, in communities where we work, the work is a gift of a certain way. I mean, I'll give you an example. We did a park in Oakland um, 20, 20 years ago, and we made, um, smoker barbecues, right? And we put four of them in this park, and this is a park where people call them homeless people, but they were just people who moved around the landscape, right? And after the park opened, you could go there, man, and these brothers and sisters are like barbecuing, you know, chickens, and this isn't downtown, right? I mean, smoke's going, people, but it's like, yeah. You know, my people come from Texas, I can make this barbecue. I mean, so there was like this thing going on. So after maybe, eight years or so when it came time to renew them, right? You know what the city did? They put in standard barbecues things, right? Those little square rectangle things. And you go there now, they're never used. Wow. They're never used. They put just standard. They just put the standard ones. park and rec things in, and they're never used. But, and the reason why I bring this up is every place, you know, People who live in places, um, you know, they do things differently, right? And when we were working on the project, one of the brothers came in the meeting and was like, man, we need some smokers out here. So I looked around and I tried to find someone who made the smokers. And we couldn't find anyone, so we actually designed the smokers. And so they really wanted something different because they're in the park all day and they wanted to barbecue. Right? At the scale of the smoker, right? Yeah, yeah. And so little things like that, we try to find those, you know, those, how can I say, those ways in, right? If you dig enough, you find those little, those little ways in to a project, and you try to then make manifest something that you can't imagine. But there's that word you use, keep on using, about paternalism, and this is the book that um, Walter uh, told me to get, it wasn't easy to find this, yeah. um, but my wife found it at Bob's <laughs> library at NYU. And, um, and so I've been reading it, and here's a quote I'd like to read that sort of, I think, speaks to uh, what you've been referring to. And it says, the dialectic of park history begins with the ideal of the pleasure grounds to serve all elements of society. Upper and middle class domination of the pleasure gardens was the reality, despite lip service to the ideal, and the pious hope that the mingling of the classes in the parks would result in the elevation of lower class manners and morals. 
Um, and so to me, it sounds like someone decided, like, you don't really need those big, unwieldy, raucous, <laughs> messy smokers. Yeah. Let us tell you what yes. you need. Yeah. And so it's not simply the usage, it's the process that, that results or does not result in what they think they need. Yeah. yeah, you have to remember when the park, the advent of the first park, let's say Central Park, uh, in this country, there were these immigrant communities, right? And if you look at, in Granz's book, she points out how this pleasure garden actually changes, right? So in the beginning, it is this notion that everyone is the same, right, in nature, Olmsted, right? Um, but they're also teaching there. But by the time you get to the 20th century, there's no more pleasure, right? There's facilities to teach you how to eat, how to groom, how to work out, you know? And so we get these parks that are all of a sudden, no more trees, it's just activity. <laughs> You know, just activity. This is I mean, good for you. Yeah, I grew up in one. You know, we had a, a basketball court. I still remember a little playground area and a swimming pool. And that's where you spent all day. And this is in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is where you spent your summers in this asphaltic jungle and free swimming in the morning and basketball in the afternoon. And of course, we went to the woods. Mm. Right? We played in the woods. We played in right-of-ways. We played along railroad tracks, right? But this notion that black people need to recreate, right? You gotta, gotta get fit. You gotta like run. You gotta jump. This was part of that idea. I mean, I found out if I went out to Myers Park, they had these other kinds of landscapes, right? There was no basketball courts. You know, big sweeping lawns, big oak trees. No playgrounds. And that was the first time it kind of occurred to me that there were these different worlds, right? And then once I went to school and started learning about it, it's like, God, this is intentional. Huh, they're actually creating our future, right, through these devices, right? And so I think we have to be really careful when we design because what we're saying is it's like the, um, um, I think it's Charles Moore, um, or uh, Doshi who did the drawing of the frog in the hot water. I think it's the frog, right? Yeah, you, you put the frog in the water and you slowly heat it up. Mm. And it doesn't mm -hmm. know it's getting hot until it's right. dead, right? Mm -hmm. And so this notion that we live in these spaces, man, and people adapt to these spaces. And then we tell them, we come up with these narratives. We're, we worked in Pittsburgh in the Hill District. And a decade ago, we did a master plan for them. And I was taken by the hill, was this amazing working class neighborhood where they removed all the coal. And then when white flight happened, they left the brothers, right? which is a typical story throughout America. We get, we get left behind, because all the wealth goes out. But this community has been there. And what I started to notice was, kids are still going to school, right? People are still living there. But the landscape, this emergent landscape had taken off. Right, the vacant lots just all of a sudden became full of black locust trees, right? There's turkeys, right? I mean, and it had become what I called a suburb. So I went out to the 19th century suburbs of Pittsburgh and I cataloged all the different kinds of spaces. And I tried to make parallel an argument for them not to redensify this neighborhood, hmm. to redensify, to hmm. cut down the black locust trees and build more housing to try to go back to something. Because what had happened, in my mind, was those two rivers in Pittsburgh had created this new landscape. And black people were in it. Mm -hmm. And one day I was walking up the street and these kids called me and said, Mr., come in here. And they were in the woods. And so I went in and there was this other world. And this is like half mile from downtown Pittsburgh. Right? And so this whole green print that we made was about keeping the woods. Right? And we try to tell them the woods are valuable. And if you're going to build in the woods, you build this way, the way they build in the suburbs. And I could not convince people because they just couldn't see us like that. And so what's happening in the Hill right now is it's changing. It's changing. They want to cut down the black locusts, right? do the things that they do everywhere else. And to me, this is our challenge. The challenge is for us to, again, dream, dream a different world for us, you know, because if you look at how much money we spend 
on the things that the environment does to us. If we took that money and invested it in our communities, we wouldn't have to spend that money right, on health care, incarceration, I mean, all of these things. I have a couple questions from people in the audience. Mm. I'm going to try to read this one. <laughs> what mechanisms do you use to engage neighborhoods, i.e., having people work in something? Have, is this Niles? Niles, you out there? You want to yes. save me? <laughs> 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 uh, my question is, is being that you've done this work in various cities, obviously it's not one size fits all, right. but what mechanisms have you used to engage these hmm. communities and get that trust? Right. So it's i.e. public meetings, yeah. getting them to take the ownership, whether it's to work, you know, to continuing the maintenance of the garden, et cetera, et cetera. So again, thank you very much. Yeah. And Niles, uh, you signed your uh, your title. You're with the Staten Island Economic Development Corporation. Great. Um, I think you. I mean, you hit it on the head. One size does not fit all. Um, going back to trust, um, you have to really. Every place is different. So we've used, we've done things differently. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we did a walking tour. Like for the final project, we said, okay, let's now walk the project. And so we made a trail through the woods. And then we marked the sidewalks with the businesses that used to be there. We sprayed them. And as we were walking, you know, you know the young kids with their pants down on the corner and people are kind of I'm like, that's fine. So we started doing this and before we knew it, we had a trail of people going up the street. Then we put the banners of the project on the police station, right, which is central in the neighborhood. And I just remember this one brother came up to me and said, man, what the hell are you doing, man? I was like, we pay their bills. So we had a barbecue there, and people actually stopped in their cars and actually then became part of the conversation. And then at the end, the brother said, I feel you. Right, but this notion that... You know, sometimes participation is not about asking people what they want to a certain way. You gotta get them, again, I, you keep using this term dream. We have to get people to try to imagine a different future for themselves. And this is the hard part because we were never meant to have a future in this country, right? And so the psychosis is black folk never had a future. We were labor, Right, and so this notion then of trying to articulate ourselves, what should that future be, but we can't do it alone. And so, again, in Arlington, Virginia, we were asked to do a town square for this neighborhood called Knock, which are descendants from the first Freedman's Village in D.C. The first Freedman's Village? Freedman's Village. And if you don't know what a Freedman's Village is, you should go and look it up, um, because it's something really important to our history. Um, but the first meeting, people kept talking about Green Valley. I was like, what are they talking about? So we got a van. I said, show me Green Valley. So we spent a day in a van, not at the project, but going through this landscape of Arlington that's being gentrified. Mm -hmm. And they were telling me the stories of, you see where that golf club course is there? That used to be blah, blah, blah. The Ford up here, that used to be. This was all of ours. And they had in their mind Green Valley which was a larger landscape. And that was so powerful to us that we tried to expand the project, right? to include the AME Church, to include the John Drew School, all of these things and kind of connecting them together. And of course the client is like, we only have the money to do this. And I was like, no, we have to dream this larger thing. And if this is the first phase, at least there's this larger connection to it. And then there's this beautiful sentinel that we're designing in the middle that will read Freed, F-R-E-E-D. And it's a 40-foot statue in gold that will be in the middle of the town square. It doesn't say freedom. It says freed. Hmm. Because as we were doing the research, we kept finding freed men, freed women. And I kept questioning, why is it freed? And it's because someone one day said, you can go. Right? And that's why we keep looking <laughs> back, because they might call us back. 
right? But this notion of, and, and we had that conversation in these community meetings that were, I mean, every time I presented, I was just, I was freaked out, right? Because I was, for the first time in the work, I was beginning to present, you know, issues like this in the work, and I hadn't done it in these community forums. And it's through a public art um, um, nonprofit, and people were so receptive. And they came up to me afterwards and said, Mr. Hood, I've never heard anyone talk about us this way. And that only gave me, right? little bravery to talk about more. But then this one brother who had just came back from Iraq, he said, well, it should say freedom. But he goes, I respect what you're trying to do, though. But I still think it should say freedom. But those are the kinds of conversations to me that not the final design, but the actual making the work, which allows you then to go and have the courage in the next project. Mm -hmm. right? And it's going to be a beautiful town square. It's got all the BMPs. It's got all the, the landscape stuff, <laughs> but it's got the sentinel, right? And so really trying to mix these things together, um, very much like this part. Well, it's interesting what you've just been describing kind of answers another question that someone submitted. Um, Walter, how do you incorporate history in your designs? Um, not sure if there's anything else you want to add to that, but. Um, Yes, this man here, Mark Robbins, and myself, he's the head of the American Academy in Rome. Thanks for coming, Mark. Um, we spent a year in Rome, and prior to that, I didn't really care about history as much, right? But you go, I mean, I didn't, I didn't care about it in the way, I mean, I took history classes, and you know, I had read all of this, but I hadn't figured out how to use it. And so we spent a year going to archeological digs, and I remember some of the first ones we went to, there was nothing there. And these archeologists would be like, we know that, that this was here, and we're like going, I don't see anything, right? And so we only wanted to go to the ones that had stuff you can sketch, right? But I, halfway during the year, though, I started to see those landscapes as these powerful places that have this memory, right? And that people would go around the world to sort of get that memory. And then I came home, and as soon as I came home, all the work then was about digging. Because what it said to me was, every place has a story. Right? And if you dig just a little bit, you'll find those stories. Right? And so every project, we try to treat it as palimpsest, as this kind of layered thing, and pull something out. And so that's how we deal with history. And so every place has a history. Um, and a lot of our projects, even today, you know, whether it's for a tech company or for a community, we try to think about places mm -hmm. um, and, and what occurred in those places beforehand so that we're always um, looking back but always moving forward, which is an old African proverb. Something you mentioned that was really illuminating in a uh, documentary that the NYRP brought to my attention from the 90s, claiming open spaces. Um, and I just want to quote something you said about architecture and open spaces that I never really, I guess, thought about. You said, African Americans or various subcultural groups in this society, they have to sit within a framework that's foreign to them, that's totally alien to them. And then you said the English open lot plan, the single family detached house. You made a contrast between that and on the other hand, the extended family and the more community activities that occur in ethnic communities. They don't fit. And so what you find are those groups improvising within that and changing that structure. And it starts to reshape the environment. And so I take it what you mean is specifically the environment outside of these buildings and these houses. If they are emerging from these houses which may not necessarily suit their yeah. needs or their family structure, yeah. they have to improvise outside yes. of, the, yeah. of, of the home, right. correct? And so then the space becomes an extension of the home in a way that may not in the society that they yeah. was sort of designed for. Yeah. No, you see it um, in a lot of places. Again, 
improvisation is one of those things that, particularly in the African-American cultural arts, this notion of reshaping the old to make something new and contemporary, right? Um, and it's, what I started to see was in my neighborhood, I would go to Berkeley daily and come back to West Oakland. And in Berkeley, everything, everybody had the same fences, you know, the same things, but I would take the bus. And as I got to Oakland, I started to see windows would be open. People would put pillows in the window and then lean out the window. Uh, girls would be getting their hair braided on the stairs, right? Guys are on the corners, right? Corners are good. And then I started remembering, ah, corners. When I was a kid, we hung out on the corners. You know why people hang out on corners? What's the great thing about a corner? You can see in four directions, and then people can see you. But you start to kind of see these patterns. And in a lot of places, people want to be seen. Because within these kind of frameworks, we're meant not to be seen. Right? And architecture has always kind of played this role of keeping us in, right, in the back or underneath. Right? And, but this chance to be out front is the powerful part of it. And, and you see it in a lot of different ways. And that's the one thing I started then keeping a diary. And that's in my book, Urban Diaries. And I would just watch things like prostitution happening on the street. And I wondered, well, why were people not, um, I guess, seeing it? Because it was almost like these acts were invisible. And then I wanted to make them visible. Right? So we were talking today like, I want to make a beer garden in a black neighborhood, right? Right next to the liquor store, <laughs> right? I mean, why not, right? I got beer gardens in Oakland out of the wazoo, right? But they're not in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But this notion that, you know, the kinds of patterns, if you looked at people's patterns and practices and you try to reinforce them, no matter if they exist outside of normative behavior or not, you'd see different things. And we'd make things different. But we see those non-normative things as negative that we then try to design out, right? And so I came up with all these things, like the street stadium, the braiding the hair bench, you know, all of these things that had this kind of power to transform but also reinforce. And I do believe if you reinforce people's patterns and practices that there will be this reciprocation that will happen, right? Will happen in some ways. And those patterns, you know, if you go to like Mexico or places, you know, Paseo, when I first heard the term Paseo, right, I was like, what's Paseo? And San Jose was making these alleyways, but then you go to Mexico, it's Paseo, it's like after dinner you go for a walk, right? And this form is there for people to go for a walk. So you go to East Oakland every day at like five or six o'clock, people are out, right? So they made the sidewalks wider. Mm. But those are patterns and practices. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that you know, we, we look for. And that along with the kind of the history, you start building these stories that begin to validate people mm -hmm. and their existence. Places to be seen and be seen. Yeah, to all get, of those yeah. things. Got a few more questions here. Same question. No, different. <laughs> Very nice handwriting. Um, OK, this is, uh, what do you think about the idea, the fact, <laughs> that having new, beautiful green spaces often leads to gentrification, displacing the original inhabitants? Common sort of a fear, yeah. suspicion. Yeah. Is there truth in it? Yeah. Yes and no. Um, this is the one thing my students, um, every time we, we do a project, that's their first thing. I don't want to make it too beautiful. Bull, bull crap. Make it beautiful. But this notion that if we make it too nice, <laughs> somebody else is going to want it. Right. They should want it, but you keep it. Right? This idea that it's got to be ugly. <laughs> it's got to be kind of brown. Right? It's got to be really benign. Right? But no, make it amazing. But if you make it in the right way, this is why I'm getting back to this kind of validation, it's not then for the gentry. The problem is we make these things for the gentry, the new people and not the old people. You know what I'm getting at? We design these new spaces as if we know the gentry is coming in. But if you looked at the group and where you're working and you designed it for them, the gentry is going to be clueless. 
to a certain degree. They don't want the big smokers. But they're going to be like, what's that? I don't know what that is. I don't know if I want to be over there, you know, whatever. But if we make it in those ways, but that can be beautiful. We're trying to get Milwaukee to plant a thousand trees in like a quarter mile little space, right? And their first thing was, no, we can't do it. It'd just be too scary, (laughs) right? And then we said, we want to make it like a quilt. So it's a linear space, and we literally were going to make it like a block quilt. And so every 50 yards, it changes, it changes, it changes, it changes. And they just couldn't get their mind around it, right? And then we told them it'll cost 15 to 20 million. They really couldn't get their mind around it, right? It's like one of the most hardened neighborhoods with like one of the worst zip codes in the country, you know? But we said, look, do it like a quilt. Start with one block, $250,000. Add another one. Mm-hmm. Add another, and another, and another, and another, and each one different. Now, this is completely different than the south part of the trail, which is the same. And that's what the gentry likes, right? So is that right, motion... gentry? You guys like that? <laughs> <laughs> you should pull the gentry. No, but this notion that, you know, difference is, is, is not a good thing in design, right? I mean, like, it's like street lights. They all have to be the same. The benches, they all have to be the same. You know, things become too homogenized. And all we're just asking for is that if you make things a little different, there's value then placed on that difference. Mm -hmm. And that value, hopefully, then, those communities then will feel validated. And people will want to be in those places. So are you saying that, um, are you saying that you can avoid gentrification design? No, I'm not saying that. Cities change. I'm saying that in places, the fear of making something new, I'm saying if we made it with a different intent, it might allow people in those spaces to feel validated, therefore giving them power. So when new people move in, they're not changing their patterns and practices. The big thing about gentrification is you're coming in, it's almost like colonialization, you're coming in and changing those patterns and practices as if those people who are there don't matter. And I always get people saying this, I discovered Oakland, right? I discovered it. Columbus did. My my students, they come in and was like, Professor Hood, I discovered Oakland. I'm like, no, you didn't. You know, but it's this notion that, right, it it doesn't exist yet, right? And all I'm saying is it does exist. And if we validate that existence, when the change happens, there's a little something for everyone versus someone getting left out, right? And my neighborhood is gentrifying at the rate that I cannot um, stop at this point. But a friend of mine told me, well, neighborhoods change. This is Rick Lowe from Project Row House. And my neighborhood's been gentrifying for 30 years. And he pointed out to me that 30 years, man, that's a generation for a lot of people. I mean, so people have lived in this place long enough. And all I want is when it changes, that there's something left behind that reflects that people live there. Right? Versus scrape it clean and these new things, Mm -hmm. which we're beginning to see. Mm -hmm. All the old goes away because it has those other memories embedded. And so some places, that's what I'm saying, I can't go home and be nostalgic anymore. Right? I'm an alien, it's an alien future for me. I forgot who said that, which is awesome. Right? It's like when I go back to these places and they've changed, it's an alien future. Right? Versus those places you can go back and go like, yeah, I remember. And that's all nostalgia is. You know, I think during the Napoleon War, it came up with um, nostalgia was a disease that these guys were away from home for a long time and they were just melancholy. So they just said, okay, if you don't snap out of it, you're gonna get shot, <laughs> right? So it's this, this psychological thing. And so I do think there is a yearning. You know, my, I grew up in the South and I could sort of see it in my parents. They, you know, they grew up in the rural part of North Carolina. So of course we had to go there every month because there was this yearning, right? And now it's gone, right? It's gone. And it's kind of sad, right? That, you know, there's just no place to return to. So. What's the name of that class? <laughs> um, the class at Yale. It's an advanced studio. But I teach landscape and memory at Berkeley. So you use the word futures. What was it? Futures. Just futures. Just called futures. Nice class. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Walter Hood.
Thank you. Uh, that was fantastic. I, I know I learned a lot. I'm inspired. The, you know, I often find it easy to sort of wrap up at the end of discussions, but this has challenged me and this has made me think. And some of the themes that I heard tonight were around trust, intentionality, and hope. And uh, Walter, you said something earlier in the evening that I would like to leave this audience with and I'd like you to think about. And what you said was, when you can imagine a different world for people that don't look like you, it's powerful. We at New York Restoration Project couldn't agree more. And we thank you and we thank Arun for being here tonight. And thanks to all of you. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>